morning. Good morning. How you doing this morning? Um, simple question: Is God worthy? Come on, let's let's let Him know He's worthy with our exhortation from our our heart, which manifests through our mouth, even in a physical body that we might lift our hands or clap them or acknowledge the great presence. God, you're awesome. You're incredible. We acknowledge you. We love you so much. We gather here today because you have brought us here. You've divinely orchestrated this moment in time. It's by your power, your grace, your love that we exist. We thank you. We magnify you. Anybody want to praise God this morning? Just Magnify you, God. Yes, Lord. Amen. Good morning to you. As you take your seats, if you would, gather with me in Galatians chapter 6. Now, I'm going to need you to help me this morning. I um, want to um, have fun in the Word this morning. Amen. And so I need you to help me out by doing what we preachers love to do is have you talk to your neighbor. So your first talk to your neighbor um, this morning is uh, it's real simple. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor. neighbor. All right, now wait a minute. Because for this neighbor to work, uh, you got to know the person gets awkward, what I'm about to say, with you if you don't know the person. So if you don't know, so switch neighbors, like if you don't. Like move around, I don't care what you have to do, but find a neighbor like you know. All right, all right. Now, now you got a neighbor you know. Try it again. Say, neighbor, yeah. I, promise you, I promise you, I'm going to be nice to you nice. for the next 30 minutes, next 30 minutes. While, he preaching. while he preaching. I make no promise, make no promise. that it will continue, it will continue. after he finished. <laughs> because... Thus is the problem in relationships with humans. We miss moments, man. And we can get a deliverance or a breakthrough or a revelation in moment A, and then it only take a matter of time for moment B to come, and we completely forget everything that just broke through in our life in moment A. And so while we jokingly say that, uh, I'd use that to draw your attention to our text this morning because Paul is going to continue with us in Galatians chapter 6 to draw us away from losing revelation and losing discipline and losing connection from moment to moment. And he's going to challenge us to grow into something that is far more spiritually mature. And so in this series on things I wish I'd known, we started with the foundation that uh, it's important to love ourselves. I wish as early in life as you can learn that, to love you some you, that that is a God-designed thing. That's not based in, in narcissism. It can be, but you've got to have a healthy sense of self um, and know that you're wonderfully made. God made you and he loves you. And then we went from there to last week uh, where we talked about uh, how important it was for, to be in relationships where people come through. And so that, that we're not draining ourselves in a one-way um, relationship where, where uh, we are always um, going down one lane and meeting somebody where they need to be met, but we're surrounding ourselves with people who cannot reciprocate, and thus ultimately we're drained in the end. But God has established for us to be supported in the community and in family to, uh, and romantically to match ourselves with people who come through. Uh, this week is not that deep. It's simple, but it's a simple thing that I think we all need to be reminded of so we don't lose it in the moment. And I think especially in this day and age, um, but I wish I knew um, sooner in my life and practiced sooner in my life uh, kindness and how much kindness heals. Uh, and I'm talking kindness beyond just conduct, 
but kindness that manifests itself in communication. Uh, you know, people, uh, we don't always talk well to each other. You know, I ain't going to get no amens from this service. But, but if the truth be told from moment to moment, we often have a way of communicating with each other that is less than stellar. And uh, it is only in when somebody appeases me or pleases me that my communication is reciprocal as long as I'm being pleased. But in a moment of my displeasure, all communication anointing falls apart. And Paul is writing about this issue amongst many to the church in Galatia. Because in this region of Galatia, after Jesus has ascended and going back to heaven, Paul's doing ministry in this area. By the time you get to Galatia chapter 6, Paul's writing to a group of people who come from different backgrounds. Some are Jews and some are new Christians and some are coming out of Greek mythology. And basically, they're having relationship problems. They can't get along because of theological differences and uh, cultural differences. And the church in these regions, in this particular region, has relational struggle. They, they don't know how to talk to each other in the public square. They don't know how to deal with each other. And, and Paul is concerned as an apostle that something's happening um, at the root that he wants to expose. And, and so I promise you, I promise you, if you stay with me for 30 minutes, uh, we will walk in the same exposure but what I want to encourage you to do is after those 30 minutes are over, that you adapt the revelation so that whatever healing begins here will continue when you get home. Amen? Amen. So verse 7 in Galatians chapter 6, NIV, Paul says, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please their flesh, from the flesh will reap destruction. And whoever sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. So let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. We will reap. We will reap. We will reap at a proper time. Time. It's interesting that Paul in this text, he, he, he kind of contrasts two things that I want you to see real quickly. He contrasts flesh uh, and spirit. And so this conversation is about maturity, spirit, and immaturity. Flesh. Flesh and spirit. But the word Paul uses to contrast them is the word pleasing. So it's the idea, Paul says, um, whatever you please, there will be a result, an outcome from that. So when you look at the text of uh, you, where you, you will reap what you sow, and Paul says a man reaps what he sows. Reaping is the outcome, but watch this. Sowing is the behavior. And so Paul then connects this and says, if your behavior of sowing is targeted towards pleasing the flesh, then you will get the results of pleasing the flesh. You will have relationships that manifest in arguments. You'll have relationships that manifest in anxiety. You'll have relationships that manifest, and Paul says, these things are destructive. You'll have destructive patterns of communication, destructive patterns of conduct. Why? Because you're reaping what you sown. What have you sown? You sow that which pleases the flesh. It's no different than, than, than saying it this way. You will always put into that which you are trying to please or that person you are trying to please. If you're trying to please your mother and you're trying to please your father, what will you do? You will do things that make them happy. You will do things that make them please. You'll do things that make them say they're proud of you. Likewise, here's what Paul's arguing. Some of us are treating the flesh like a parent. Whereas we're doing things to get a pat on the back from our flesh, that we appease our flesh. And our flesh, well, what is that? I'm not talking about your skin. I'm not talking about your tone. I'm talking about your inner man. In other words, some of us think that our altitude is controlled by external circumstances. But I'm here to tell you this morning that your altitude is controlled by something internal. And the internal thing that controls your external altitude 
is your attitude. And your attitude is based upon where you target. If you please the flesh, you will get the results of the flesh. If you please the flesh, you will have destructive relationships. If the truth be told this morning, each one of us might have piles of people that we could put in the destructive relationship pile. Look at your neighbor this morning and say, neighbor, how many do you have? There's some friends in that pile that we're not even friends with no more. There's some boyfriend, girlfriend in that pile. There's some spouses in this room married and some people still in the pile. Because what has manifested is flesh. Paul says if this is what you chase after, this is what you get. So part of the way that we get to see, part of the way we get to see and examine ourselves in this text is what, what are we manifesting? What are, what are we reaping? Write this down if you're taking note. Reaping kindness, kindness is like harvest. What we grow depends on what we sow. Somebody say that with me. Say what we grow depends on what we sow. So why are you so upset? When folk talk nasty to you. When you keep talking nasty to everybody else. <laughs> See, we want the outcome. We always focus on outcomes. I want the outcome. Tell me how to make 20% of my investment. Tell me how to do this. We always want outcomes. We rarely want to focus on behavior that causes the outcome. So think about this. Think about let, let, let me, let's, let's get some deliverance this morning. Let's just jump right in. Let's just jump right in deliverance. I want you to be honest with me this morning, all right? Y'all ready to be honest? Okay, all right. Y'all ready to be honest? Okay. Raise your hand. Raise your hand if you have been accused of by anybody that loves you of being nasty with your attitude, talking down to folk, being mean to folk, being grumpy, fussing, Scream. I'm, I'm going to get all these hands up because some of y'all just lying. Just, y'all just be lying on a Sunday morning. Okay, now watch this. And when you were accused of that, how did that help your relationships? What did you reap? What did you reap? You, you reap the repercussions of the lack of that kind communication. I don't want this to get too far, so I'm, I'm leaving in conversation because God says, watch this. God says, Paul says, Paul says, um, God says to Paul in this text, um, God cannot be mocked. What does that mean? God cannot be mocked. In other words, Paul is saying this is such a divine principle. See, most of us get this confused because we've only heard the prosperity preachers use it from 2 Corinthians chapter 9. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, Paul is speaking to that church, of uh, that church about the faith of giving and supporting his ministry when he comes uh, to Macedonia to preach in that region um, to be able to carry the expenses of that ministry coming there and he's done it for free too long and he needs them to step up their support and so we hear that you reap what you sow so man reap you sow sparingly because you, you reap sparingly because you sow sparingly so give me some more money right so we get that right uh, but that that's only one uh, application of the text the application of the same principle that is divine is right here in Galatians chapter 6, and it's completely relational. It has nothing to do with money. It has to do with examining the maturity of our relationships to see what we're walking after. Look at your neighbor again, the third time. Say, neighbor, you get to decide right now. Who do you walk after? Spirit? Flesh? Which answer did they give you? Somebody said it depends on when you catch me. <laughs> right now, I would, I would say spirit. But the Bible says God can't be mocked, which means we can't cheat him. You would do whatever you need to do to satisfy the old nature of the flesh. The old nature of the flesh is combative. The old nature, nature of the flesh is argumentative. The old nature of the flesh is petty. It's condescending. It's irritable. It's mean. It's grumpy. It's all of us. 
But there is this revelation on the other side that either you can have destruction or you can have life. And what life looks like in the spirit is um, a repositioning or recalibration of our internal workings so that we can do what the spirit calls us to do. I'm going to prove to you, I'm going to prove to you, the spirit of the Lord has been trying to mature you in these conversations so that you have more romance and, 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 and intimacy and friendship and camaraderie. And the reason I can help you get this revelation is because I've been in the same moment with you. And the same test that the Lord has given me, I'm going to give you right now. Y'all ready for another test? Okay, here we go. Here we go. But this requires you to be honest again. You have to be honest with this test. The last time you was fussing with somebody and you said something nasty or mean, did you hear anything in your voice, a voice anywhere afterwards tell you that you said something wrong or you shouldn't have said it that way? Raise your hand. Raise your hand if that's you. Whoever has their hand down don't have the Holy Ghost. I'm just, I'm messing with you. I'm messing with y'all. That's not true. That is not theologically accurate at all. Trust me. I just went way to the left on that. Y'all saved. The Lord loves you. We just have more Holy Spirit. I'm, just, I'm, I'm playing with you again. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Watch this. God can't be mocked. So you will never be able to say to God, the Spirit wasn't trying to mature you in the moment. Because in that moment where you blew it, the Spirit was trying to get you to fix it. And what did you, who did you walk after? Did you follow the Spirit right out the argument and do what the Spirit said and said, well, babe, you know, you know I could be grumpy sometimes. <laughs> did you do that? Or did you do, you know, what, you know, y'all know what we do when we, when we get mad at the other people, right? We do, we, do, we do the crazies. You know what the crazies are? When we just talk to ourselves. <laughs> 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 Getting my nerves. <laughs> we do the crazies. Follow, watch this. Because that's what the flesh wants to hear. That's, that's what pleases it. So Paul's talking about natural versus spiritual. You ever heard the saying, um, talk is cheap? Okay, that's a lie too. No, talk is expensive. Talk has a price. If you want to practice kindness in your communication, it's laborious. It, 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 it has a price because it takes a patience, a grace, an aptitude. It takes a person. All conversations take perseverance, long suffering. You need all the fruit of the Spirit. You need the Holy Ghost. You need Jesus. You need the Father. You need the Son. You need Apostle Paul. You need John. You need Mary. You need Moses. You need all, all of Adam, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. Find me somebody else. You need them all. You need them all. Talk is not cheap. Talk has a price. Because talk is intimate. And talk that is spiritual will cause change to happen behaviorally. And so the flesh don't want that. And the enemy is stoking the flesh like a flame in a, in a campfire. The enemy is just fanning the flame. He's just in that cup. You know, when you get the crazies, the enemy is just talking to you. And you know, you know, you know something wrong when you start hearing answers back. You know, I mean, doing all this is already signs that something needs to be investigated. But when you get answers back to yourself, y'all have heard actions speak louder than words. That's true, though. That was not a lie. But it's not wholly true. Because what it doesn't acknowledge is that words are still loud. Just said what you do is louder than what you say. But what you say can destroy 20 years of relationship building. It'll take you your lifetime to find meaningful relationships with people who love you, want to be your friends. It'll take you two seconds to destroy it. Two seconds. So, the flesh is physical. 
It's self-centered. So Paul says, uh, watch this. So the flesh is only satisfied when it gets what it wants. So communicating with fleshly people, it's hard to practice kindness, but we have to. But you gotta, I got to expose this because uh, when you're trying to be kind with fleshly people, they only care about uh, what they get out of this. The flesh thinks in full benefit, but the scripture thinks in full behavior. So we think in full benefit. What do I get out of this? So I engage in the conversation just because I want to get my point across or I want to get them to do what I want them to do. But, but I really don't necessarily want to shift my behavior. Well, how do I know that? Because the flesh will tell you before you start the conversation, you're right. And the flesh makes you assume that all, 100% the other person is wrong. And the flesh gives you a new level of anointing. For you people that don't know what anointing is, it, the anointing comes from God. It is like power. And the Bible says the anointing, speaking of like oil, destroys yokes. Yokes being like ropes around animals' necks. The anointing is like a power from God. And some of us get a brand new power from God. It's the power of superlatives. The anointing to declare you always. The anointing to declare you never. The anointing to say, you can't. And that is the flesh. And the flesh don't want a conversation. It wants a one-way track. Which simply says, you're wrong, I'm right, and our only engagement is for me to prove how wrong you are. But counter to that is the spirit. And the spirit is life-giving. Somebody say life-giving. The spirit walks after Christ. The spirit lays down, not in a way of cowardness, but in a position of strength because the spirit sows. Let me help you with this. You have eternal life and you are reaping the benefits of salvation because of what Jesus sowed. On Calvary, he laid down his life. He sowed, he, he said, nobody takes my life, I give it. Like a seed, I plant myself in the ground so a harvest of souls can make it into the kingdom of God. The Spirit leads you to sow. The flesh will cause you to do things all the wrong way. Like, for instance, talk at the wrong time. See, that, that self-centeredness, i got to solve this problem now because I'm mad. But what if you're mad at the wrong time? What's the wrong time? Anybody ever been in a season of stress? And I ain't talking about a moment. I'm not talking about a day. I'm talking about stress. You walk out the door, stress be like, good morning, how you doing? You get to work, stress be like, welcome to, welcome to work today. We're going to wear you out. I'm talking about that kind of stress, that level of stress, right, where you're just wearing it. You ever had that moment? Why folk always want to talk when you're stressed out? People, that's not a good time to talk. That's a good time to practice kindness in communication, to offer grace in communication, but to get all philosophically deep about how we're going to fix our relationship after being laid off, that is not the spirit, not the time. How about, how about um, times of fatigue? Not a great time. You know, some of us destroy relationships just because we're tired. We'd be better off to, to sow a simple communication like, you know, I'm, I'm tired right now. And uh, I'm, not, you know, I'm not trying to be funny, but uh, I, I'm tired right now. And so if you talk to me, uh, I don't have the capacity for this conversation. Right, 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 right. Now, you can't control their ballistic behavior in response to that. <laughs> what you mean you don't want to talk right now? <laughs> Look, man, <laughs> I'm just saying, yeah, yeah, I'm tired. Oh, 
What about periods of high activity? Wrong time. Wrong time. I don't know why you women want to wait to two minutes left in the fourth quarter to start rebuilding our love and work on what we was talking about two days ago. And because I'm stupid and a dude, I forgot all about it. Because all I can focus on right now is my team has the ball. We need 17 yards and we're down by 10. My whole house could be burning up and I wouldn't know it. I wouldn't know it. I'd just be burning. Firemen just come in. I'm TV right there. They just be spraying. I don't know why. Here's a high activity. And bro, we gotta think, bro, 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 bro. We don't, bro. We don't, bro. We don't think. We don't think, bro. We don't think. We don't think. We don't think. Why you wanna? Why you wanna try to fix it? I mean, we probably broke it, but. <laughs> Let's just skip past that part. But why we want to try to do makeup and fix it after somebody else has already worn out. You know, especially if you got one of them throwback sisters that's very detail-oriented, organized. That means she worn out by the end of the day. She had to work, you know. And, you know, we talk about help with the kids. Ain't nobody. We don't help with no kids. When we say help with the kids, that means, you know, look at her while she helping the kids. I mean, looking does take a lot out of us. I'm just, I mean, watching is an activity. Now, she don't fix dinner. We don't help clean the house. Drop our clothes everywhere. We do. Garbage need to be taken out. We going to get to it because the fourth quarter. So she tired and then we could be, man, she don't have time. If you're taking notes, write this down. These type of behaviors must end and life giving behaviors must begin. But life giving behaviors are not one time. So reaping kindness is a result of continual so. In other words, what Paul gives us a picture of is like uh, 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 somebody in agriculture. It's not the idea of one seed in one moment. That is, that is still, see, in other words, if you don't sow continually, you're still in the flesh. The maturity of the spirit is life-giving like Jesus. In other words, ask yourself a simple question. How many times do you think Jesus would die for us if he had to keep on dying? He'd keep on dying. He wouldn't die one time. So likewise, when you're operating in your relationships with family, friends, and your, your romantic interests, it's the idea of, of pleasing the spirit, Paul says. This pleasing the spirit results and manifests in uh, making us holy and redeems our relationships. In other words, we reap ever la eternal life. That's another way of saying everything you want out of this relationship, you don't have to fight with each other there in Galatia. The only thing you need to do is start to walk after the spirit. And when that voice tells you you was too nasty or you said that too wrong or you were too grumpy or you were too irritable or you were too mean, submit to the spirit. Walk after the spirit because there is life. Here it is, Galatians 5.22. Same book, earlier chapter. You know this. Fruit of the Spirit, verse 22, 5, is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And against these things, there is no law. What is Paul saying? Paul's saying, watch this. Here's how you know in your relationships you're actually growing spiritually. So you can reap the manifested benefits of a spiritual growth and development. Here's how you know. Paul says, there is no law. These things don't have to be written down in a book. Like the Ten Commandments, the law. Because these things are the manifestation of a mature believer. 
that come directly from Holy Spirit. They, they, watch this. The Bible describes them not plurally, but singularly. It's not um, one or the other, and this is not like going to shop right where you go into the fruit section and you pick an apple and you pick an orange and you pick an avocado. You don't get to do that. Here, the Bible says one submission for one fruit, but the fruit is described uh, with all these different aspects. Watch this. You don't get fruits of the Spirit. That's just bad vernacular. That's just ebonics. That is when you read the book of Job's instead of uh, the book of Jobs instead of the book of Job. It's no fruits of the Spirit. It is fruit. One fruit. And the parts of that one fruit look like love, peace, forbearance, and kindness. And Paul says you get this in time. God will not be mocked. If you sow it, you will reap it. But you can't sow it today and not sow it tomorrow. You've got to sow it in pro somebody say in proper time. Which means you can't fuss after one mistake. Y'all know how we broker, right? Here's how we broker. We have a breach in the relationship, right? And so we do the whole, if you do this, I'll do that, right? Or I did this because you did that, which turns into if you do this, I do, I'll do that. So we start off with I did this because you did that. Well, I, the way I talk like that is because, you know, you always got the attitude. Well, it means I always got an attitude. It's because the way you talk. Well, if you would stop having so much attitude, I wouldn't talk that way. And then we, you know how we do, and it's just, you just get tired after 18 hours of just like, it's, it's, you're saying the same thing, just 100,000 different ways, and nothing happened. So then finally we get tired, and then we broker, you know, this is what we call walking after the Spirit, which is incomplete. We think we're being spiritual when we go all time out, and we be like, well, okay, well, okay, well, if you try not to be so grumpy, then I'll try not to have so much attitude. All right, well, if you try not to have so much attitude, then I'll try not to be grumpy. And then we're like, all right, I promise you, I'm not going to have no attitude. All right, I promise you, I'm not going to be grumpy, right? And here's what happens. For 24 hours, we all lock. Hey, baby, how you doing? Hey, how you doing? By the, you know, watch this. By the law. Problem that happened in the Old Testament is the law wasn't written on their hearts. It stayed on the paper. Paul said the fruit of the Spirit, there is no law. It's a natural byproduct of a closer relationship with God. So then what happens is when, here it is, 24 hours later, somebody slipped up and forgot the deal. He came grumpy. And Lord, World War III broke out. Excuse me? Who are you talking to like that? See? You always, that's when we get back to that anointing. That's how, see, that's how you always do. So you always doing this. What you mean always doing this? And we right back to nonsense. Paul says in proper time. One error, one setback. You don't get to lock stuff down. Y'all know what I mean by lock stuff down, right? Just to the married folks in the room. Because y'all single folk need to have some stuff locked down anyway. Because walking after the flesh will keep you on Tinder. And on Tinder, you'll swipe left and right from a left problem to a right problem. Because Tinder is built on a model of Galatians 6 to please the flesh only. To leave you empty. And people aren't trading cards. You shouldn't swipe a relationship. So here it is. We walk after the flesh. We do retribution. We, we, we lock people down. You know what lockdown is, right? You can't have none. Now, some of y'all don't know what none is. That means you ain't getting none. <laughs> so, that's a whole separate sermon. I can't help you today. And none mean different for some people. For some, none mean none. All-inclusive package, like a hotel. No bed, no breakfast, no nothing. For some, it means no, 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 no touch. For, for some, none mean no kiss. For some, none mean no me even looking at you no more because I'm mad at you. 
That's walking after the flesh. Because the spirit is always life-giving. And the spirit is into resurrection and resuscitation. Yeah, that's good. And instead of locking stuff down, that's when you're supposed to open stuff up. Because yeah, yeah. the spirit, for those of you who don't get the revelation and you want to get all creepy Christian on me, <laughs> acting like you don't watch worse content on TV. On. I got to keep going every week because y'all too fake. <laughs> and I'm just a real preacher. I'm a deliverance preacher, so if you want to come in here and act like you don't watch HBO, Showtime, Skinamax, you're in the wrong church. Go to the church down the street, because we talk real up in here, because the fruit of spirit is forbearance. Forbearance means no lockdown. Even you guys dating, y'all locked down different ways. We all locked down. We don't talk to each other. And so now we're going we're gonna to abuse each other. Instead of being kind to each other, we look for ways to pay you back. I'm not talking to you no more. The word kindness there in Galatians 5, I, we got to go, but I want to unpack this real quick for you. The word kindness in the Greek is an interesting construct because it's a word Paul uses that is also... Um, a title. So it's a title. And the translation of that word kindness uh, is your grace. Well, let me help you with this. So uh, as a bishop, in various circles, the formal way to address a bishop of the Lord's church and the Lord's church, that's not impact. That is once you are a bishop properly and duly consecrated and recognized um, that means you're a bishop of the Lord's church. That means the, the, the seat of bishops, there is that order around the world. So a Catholic bishop, a bishop of the Episcopalian church, bishop in the Pentecost church, all, all bishops of the Lord's church. No different than in the days when Paul and the apostles assigned bishops. And since that day, and um to now, in certain political circles, if I meet with dignitaries or meeting with um, other bishops or uh, I'm operating in my capacity as a bishop, the proper address, even in letters and salutations to me, is your grace. It's your grace. You know, and some of you are like, oh, your grace, who do you think he is? I think I is a bishop. And it took me, it's awkward, you know what I'm saying? You go from being a pastor one day, you go to consecration service and all this other stuff, and then now you just, you're a bishop. And in certain countries, when I go to like um, Africa or the Middle East or we go out to Asia, people have a higher reverence for the bishopric and the episcopacy than they do here in the West. And so, it's, you know, it's your grace, it's your grace, it's your grace. Now, here's where your grace comes from. So thousands of years, your grace reflects the bishop operating in the capacity of Christ as under shepherd. And so he, he, he or she's addressed as your grace in recognition of that which is on their life, the value that God has placed on them to the church. This is the word that Paul uses in the fruit of the spirit to describe kindness. He says that kindness means when you're dealing with each other, it is dealing like dealing with your grace. And your grace you don't reduce down. Your grace you lift up. Your grace you don't tear down. Your grace you exalt. Your grace you submit to. Your grace you honor. Your grace you respect. You don't bring your grace down to your level. You rise up to the level of your grace. So Paul uses this word for kindness. See how the devil's gotten us in the flesh? Paul says what kindness looks like is in the midst of a discussion, you're supposed to treat each other if you're in the spirit like you're talking to your grace. Like you're talking to someone worthy of respect, not someone that's trash to you. Talking to your brother worse than you talk to your best friend who's a male. That's not your grace. Talking to your parents 
in a way that you would never talk to somebody else's parents. You go around everybody else's parents and act all nice and everybody else's parents brag about you. Oh, wow, you're so wonderful. And you talk to your mama like a dog. That's not your grace. You're going to church and you and you you smiling to everybody. <laughs> oh, how you doing, brother so and so? Brother so brother so and so at home ain't getting no brother so and so. He don't get no fellowship of greeting, no welcome to my church, no how you doing, no praise God, no blessed and highly favored, none of that. That's not your grace. And you don't treat your wife at home. And you don't treat your girlfriend in the conversation like you treat them sisters in church. You want to walk all up in church and act like you're the man. Hey, how you doing? Praise God. All right, opening doors and us, all that kind of stuff. And have no temperament at home. Walking out the flesh. Improper time. That's a set season for your return on investment. It has to be continued. Your grace ain't, see, in other words, I'm not just a bishop today. I have been made a bishop till I die. Yes. I'm going into heaven as Bishop DeAndre. That's how Paul going to introduce me, the angels, all of them. They're going to be up there, and they're going to be like, hey, it's Bishop DeAndre Salter. <laughs> they're not going to call me DeAndre no more. They're not, they're, Bishop De, what? Because I, that's the grace that's on me. It's, conti it's a continual grace. So it's a continual sowing. And you can't see them as your grace today and see them as your trash tomorrow. Are you guys with me? Yeah. Let's take a moment and just lighten it up a little bit. And say your neighbor. That's why I said your neighbor because it's different than neighbor. So we can lighten it up. Say your neighbor, your grace. <laughs> your neighbor, your grace. Here it is. We got to go. Write this down. Kindness is a decision. We're going to leave on this. James 4 and 7. Here's what I'm asking you to do. To thwart the enemy's attacks in our relationships, James gives us a very simple conclusion. He says, submit yourselves then. Now, understanding all this, here's how we get out of this mess. Because I told you, kindness heals. Talking nice to each other goes a long way. I employ a lot of people. But the ones that talk to me nice, they make more money than the mean ones. <laughs> That's just how it works. Kindness heals. James says, submit yourself then to who? Submit yourself to who? You don't need a referee other than him. I understand you want to sign up for counseling. Counseling is pointless for you if, you if you're going to stay in a fleshly immaturity. My time, my time is going to be wasted with you. Because all I'm going to try to do is get you to submit to God in the first place. So we can skip all that and just submit to God right now. Because it's only in submitting to him that you can see your grace on them. Are you following me? He says, then resist the devil. How many of you know the devil is trying to... The devil has been trying to destroy relationships since humans were first created. God says that you need to have fulfilling human relationships, camaraderie, or romance, intimacy, all those things. He said that of himself because in Genesis, he created Adam, and Adam was walking around there alone, and God said, it's not good for this brother to be alone. So a relationship is God-ordained. Genesis chapter 1, everything cool. Genesis chapter 2, everything cool. In the Genesis chapter 2, here's how it ends. The brother going to leave his mother and father's house, and he's going to cleave. Cleave mean ride or die. Cleave mean come through. Cleave mean in there to win it. Cleave mean I don't even mention the word divorce because it's not even the option because I cleave. Cleave mean I'm here with you. I'm going through with you. Good, bad, sickness, health. Cleave mean me and you versus the world. Cleave mean just one entity. Cleave mean no longer two of us. Cleave mean we got one vision. We got one life. We got one love. Cleave mean us against everybody. Us. Cleave means that. But the first verse of chapter 3, and then there was the most subtle beast in the garden. The devil didn't show up in chapter 1 when it was Adam. Devil didn't show up in chapter 2 when it was Adam and God. He only showed up when another human showed up. Which means he's against every form of human relational happiness that you could ever have. 
Resist him. He wants you in the flesh and destructive relationships. He wants you to be destroyed and you to be the destroyer. But today God says, walk after the spirit. There is life. There's, there's, a, there's a brand new healing. And he won't flee. He won't let your relationships go until you flee from him. Some of you, I feel this in the name of Jesus. Some of you, even in your family relationships, even as you apply it in that context, some of you need to flee some old alts. Resist the devil taking you back to when you was 10 years old and what they said. And see the, your grace on them. And what God has is, is calling them to do and calling them to be and find healing in that kindness to offer the olive branch and begin to speak to them and sow the seeds. I guarantee you, they know what they said and did. And kill them with that kindness. Kill them with the spirit of God. They know it takes more than just you because they know you and you fought them last time. It's time to get healed and delivered. So in the moment, we don't lose it. In that moment of argument. Y'all ready for one more level of deliverance? Here we go. Because in that moment, you'll say something that you'll regret. You'll, you'll cuss folk out. Who, raise your hand if you're one of my cussing saints. Come on, just raise your hand. Come on, Come on raise your hand. We're getting healed today. Come on now. You bring them on up now. Come on now. Come on. It's safe. It's safe. Come on, my cousin. Say, it's, it's safe. All right. All my cousin saints, look around you. You're sitting around all my lion saints. All the, all the cussers, they're the liars. It's, I heard, I see people with their hands. I heard some of them cuss. I'm just telling you. I'm messing with y'all. I haven't heard nobody cuss. I, I'm just... I'm just messing with y'all. I, I haven't heard nobody cuss. Uh, raise your hand if you heard your neighbor cuss. I'm messing with you. That's <laughs> how you get deliverance in the house. God don't work with faith. Resist the devil. Watch this. He just left. That was a powerful moment. Don't miss that. He was still with you if you couldn't raise your hand. But he left you when you put your hand up because you submitted to this. I'm trying to help you. You submit it right there. You can do it. You can do it. Come on, stand to your feet. Let's pray our way out of this. Come on. In the name of Jesus, Father, we just give you praise. We give you glory. We give you glory. We magnify you right now. You're an incredible God. Just lift your hands to the Lord. There's some relationship healing right now in the name of Jesus. Father, we just receive you right now. We ask you right now, would you just heal us from the inside out? We pray that we live in the fullness of Galatians chapter 5 and 6. We pray, Father, that you will cause us to see the grace on those that we're in relationship with. And that we would submit to you and resist the devil. We are so tired of his attack on us. The strength that we're missing by being alone. We don't want that. We want to be full. We want to be strong, which means we need people. We need love. We need generosity. We need charity. We need hope. So we're praying right now. Would you heal brothers and sisters? Would you just go right now into the past and just remove the pain of poor conversational, poor conversations and just go into the past of marriages and just begin to work from the inside out we pray right now with our hands uplifted that there will be freedom that you would give us the ability to talk better to one another we pray that even amongst our friends even in even in this incredible month reflecting on history that we learn to talk to our people better that we speak life would you remove from our vocabulary you can't you never you always you ain't and would you supplant that with I see, you can, I believe, I'm with you. Father, we just pray in the name of Jesus that you will never be mocked and that the manifestation of this is that we will reap what we've sown and you're going to send kind folks to us. 
folks that see the grace on our life. You're going to take away the ones that the enemy is fooling to distract us and release to us, God, those dream builders and those, those ones that speak life. And we receive them now. Make room for them now. In Jesus' name, we praise you. Come on, give God some glory. Hallelujah. God bless you.